Mm -hmm. Well, let's shift gears to the microkernel design because I you've talked. I, I guess you sort of were talking about this in another sense with when you're talking about GNOME with GNOME's effect. Obviously, it's not a kernel, but it's that same monolithic design where all of the plugins are running as that single process, and if something goes yeah. down, it all goes down. Linux is the same way, where you have your drivers in the kernel, the driver crashes, goodbye Linux. So, why is it that you feel this way about the microkernel design? Obviously, that is one aspect of it, but I'm sure there's more to it than just that. Yeah, the reliability concerns are very important. That uh, It is possible for monolithic kernels to try and sandbox their drivers, but at the end of the day, when you're compiling all these things into the same process, the same program, uh, there, there are limits to what you can do. Mm -hmm. And so having, having a well-defined interface between different driver processes, that means that they're not relying on each other in any way, shape, or form, and we can swap them out very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not trying to define something inside of a space where any driver could decide to go around those definitions. Uh, and, and I feel like there is, there is a lot more work that has to be done up front to define an interface like that. And, and this also continuously has to happen in, as we come up with new problems that can't be solved without having new functionality. But that was a very short period of time. Now we're in, in the place where we're just, we can just pump out drivers so long as we have data sheets for them, which is really the hardest thing is to get hardware companies to actually describe what their hardware does. They will dump in a huge file into the Linux kernel and okay, here's this big ass file, it works, but it, it's not really portable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's specific to the Linux kernel and it means the Linux kernel gets support for hardware uh, in, in preferentially. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't send those things to BSD often, free BSD, open BSD. They're not, they're not sending their hardware patches there. There are customers that are saying, hey, we're using this on a Linux server. Can you support it on Linux? And like, okay, here's this huge ass driver file yep. to, to put into Linux. And uh, the, the, mon the monolithic model is easier for vendors to work in in that manner because they can just dump huge pieces of, of code into the Linux kernel and do literally anything they have to to make it work. Uh, but in the long run, what that means is that these huge pieces of untrusted code are all living together in the same space. And because the information about the hardware is never public and is written by the vendor, uh, like Realtek will write a driver for something where the data sheet is NDA. You can't, you can't read it, you can't distribute it unless you contact them directly for every instance, every copy of it. And that means that most Linux kernel developers are never going to, to see information about the hardware being handled by that driver. But that driver coexists in the same process space that they're coexisting in. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a messy situation. And bugs happen repeatedly in this kind of situation where, um, where drivers operate in ways that aren't expected. And this can especially be seen with the NVIDIA driver, which is kind of, it still lives in the same space. It's inserted into the process space but it comes from separate code. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very strange model. It's almost like a microkernel, but doing the opposite. And you have a process that, that is reading third-party code mm -hmm. that nobody who created the Linux kernel is reading all the code that goes into the NVIDIA driver, unless you're talking about the new open source driver they have, which is still using like a huge 500 megabyte blob in user space to control things. So it's not really open source. They put this huge DKMS module into the Linux kernel and it runs in the same code space. You have some modularity at the source code level, which I like improving modularity, but you don't have any review of that code that goes in the same code space. So mm -hmm. having each process be um, independent, sandboxed, each driver, each, each vendor, uh, and whatever weird stuff they need to do has to be through a unified interface, it just really appeals to me. Mm -hmm. 
So, do you see the monolithic design of the Linux kernel to be sort of a failing of the project, or more just a symptom of the circumstances it was made under, where, you know, Linus just made it because he had a CPU lying around, and the monolithic design was the easier way to approach it, as opposed to doing a more uh, microkernel design? Yeah, absolutely. There there were, of course, the, the debates between Tenenbaum and, and Linus. They're and, very fun. <laughs> and to be fair to both of them, I don't think either of them really understood the other one's position enough to to talk intelligently about it because Tenenbaum wanted to create a research operating system mm -hmm. that that uh, that would that would embody the microkernel spirit. And Minix is definitely that. Minix 3, amazing piece of work. And and Linus created a I think Linus is working more from a pragmatic standpoint of everyone else is doing monolithic kernels. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna do one too. But it's going to be open source. Mm -hmm. And and that was the primary concern. So now it's built up so much momentum and there's so much involvement with the Linux kernel, it's impossible to change. And it's been that way for, for quite a long time. It would be impossible. And uh, I don't think Redox is necessarily going to succeed in drawing in any kind of vendor integration. Like the, the vendors love this model because mm -hmm. you can create Android devices and put a huge blob into the Linux kernel and it uh, almost absolves them of any open source responsibility. Because if you look at like the blobs that these, especially GPU vendors dump into the Linux kernel, it is some of the worst code I've ever seen. And, and there is no way you can look at that code and actually create a specification for the device from that code. Mm -hmm. It is, it is too nasty. And, and, and uh, in many cases, idiotic and, and it often doesn't work. And so they're constantly going back to the board all three of them, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, plus all the ARM ones that are even worse. Like, like, uh, and I don't know what the ARM GPU situation is, but like Mali or whatever, they, they just Broadcom, these, these companies, they, they are absolutely terrible about it, but it works for them. Mm -hmm. They are not going to switch to a different kernel or a different model. They're invested in Linux. And as long as people buy their hardware, that's what's going to dominate. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame Linus for that. He did it for pragmatic reasons. And Tenenbaum didn't have anything to demonstrate uh, that had the same kind of force. So if, if, you, if you're going to say, hey, guys, look at Minix. It's, it's possible to make a microkernel. Well, someone can just say, well, look at Linux. It has so many more devices supported. It has so much more software available. So maybe you're wrong. And in the end, I think microkernels definitely are a better design for reliability, for safety, and so many different reasons. But if nobody is invested directly into cre pre creating microkernels, uh, for, especially for the desktop market, uh, then it's not going to happen. 